Rubini, yesterday we were talking about the Mughal contribution to Indian art. Not many people know that despite being an, unable to read or write, uh, the great Mughal Emperor Akbar was a bibliophile and one of the greatest patrons of art in Islamic and Indian art history. Very amazing when you consider the amount of uh, architectural manuscript, painting and uh, arms and armor production that happened during his reign. If we go straight into this manuscript, for example, part of the Belgrave collection in the Answer to the Islamic World cell, it's made in Bukhara, mid 16th century Persian poetry, great quality, royal quality in fact, as we know from this page of inscriptions, showing that it was in Akbar's library by 1597 and then also inspected during the reigns of Jahangir and Shah Jahan. And the best thing I find about interesting about it is that it's described in Arabic, awwal awwal, meaning first, first, to show that it was the very top grade, top class, something reserved for just the very best things. Are these inscriptions in the hand of both Shah Jahan and Jahangir? Yeah, I mean, that's what's extraordinary about it. Later on, in fact, its distinguished provenance continues as we can see here on this label saying that it was exhibited in Burlington House in London in 1931 as part of the incredible exhibition of Persian art. That is really wonderful. One other thing we should look at also from the Akbar period, which we know because it was it's dated 1574 to 1575. What do you think of that script there? Absolutely tiny. Tiny, but very legible. Very legible with this beautiful uh, floral decoration in the margins, which is very much off the period. An incredible survival. I think one of only two Qurans that can be recorded as during Akbar's reign. And it's complete. And it's complete. Tell us about, Rumini, this extraordinary jade object. Well, one of the most important lots in the sale, possibly one of my favorites, is this small early Mughal jade jar dated to circa 1600, which makes it about 400 years old, towards the end of Akbar's reign and the beginning of Jahangir. It's got amazing supple decoration on it compared to, you know, later Mughal arts. Yes, very simple form and elegant decoration. These beautiful lotus leaves incised around the body. Can I have a... Well, it's got an amazing tactile quality, this, and a lovely dark jade. It comes to us from the Gwenol collection, and it was on loan to the Brooklyn Museum um, from 1979. It has a real presence as an object. Speaking of the Mughal rulers, we have four paintings from an imperial album, which we refer to as the Prince Kuram album because it was assembled for Prince Kuram, the grandson of Akbar, the son of Jahangir. The paintings are produced by Mughal artists working at the royal court, but the reverse of each painting has very elegant calligraphy by the young prince when he was possibly between the ages of 16 and 19. Um, of the four that we have in the sale, one of them is signed and one of them is dated in the hand of the prince, which makes them quite rare and very special. And they don't appear very regularly on, on the market. I think the whole album, such as what was left of it, was sold here at Sotheby's in 1959. We also have here this very different, much flashier Indian object. What can you tell us about this piece? This beautiful, lavishly decorated card case for your business cards, Benny, if you so fancy it. The card case, possibly for playing cards, produced in Rajasthan in the 19th century, very elaborately decorated, set with diamonds on all sides, enameled profusely, with beautiful floral pattern, with these tiny little birds amongst the flowers. And in a way, a continuation of Mughal pattern. Um, you see Mughal influence over the years. This was produced 300 years after the Mughal jade we were talking about. So probably made in, in Jaipur, you say. That links us to our other collection of Indian painting, which is predominantly from Rajasthan and uh, the northern Pahari courts of India as well. Yes, we have a collection of Indian paintings. One of my favourite lots is this beautiful painting depicting the family of Shiva. It's got Shiva and Parvati seated on a high pedestal, uh, looking at their son, the elephant-headed deity Ganesh, produced in Rajasthan, probably in Bundi, at around 1665, it has incredible details. The more you look at it, the more you notice with these beautiful, glorious reds and oranges um, set 
alongside cool blues and greys. It's a beautiful work of art. And speaking of immensely vibrant palettes, what's your favourite painting from the, the Pahari selection we have in the collection? The Pahari selection, uh, we have a very important painting from the Gita Govinda series of 1730. We have three Gita Govinda series associated with the Pahari region in the 18th and the 19th centuries. And this is the earliest of the three. Um, it comes to us from the Ehrenfeld collection and it illustrates an episode from a 12th century poem called the Gita Govinda, which illustrates the divine love between Krishna and Radha. I guess that moves us then onto the second half of the 18th and the 19th centuries when really the new patrons of Indian painting uh, in India were the colonial powers of the British and the French commissioning these large series of natural history watercolours on this large scale European paper. And we have in the sale examples from all the major series. We do, Commissioned yes. by William Fraser. The MP family. Major James Nathaniel Rind and of course Claude Martin who fought for the British and the French and who imported some 17,000 sheets of European paper uh, upon which to have this series of natural history illustrations drawn. Company school artists are often unknown. We don't know the names of many of these artists, but we have a landscape depicting the Agra Fort by Sita Ram, who traveled with the Marquis and Marchioness of Hastings. We know when the work was painted because of a set of very detailed diaries kept by the patron. So we know when they would have visited the Agra Fort, when the subject was sketched, when the watercolors were drawn up. Speaking of Agra Fort, of course, that brings us to this rug that we're sitting on. The rug that we're sitting on was produced in Agra in the 19th century. And one of the most important and interesting facts about it is that it was woven by women weavers um, who were in jail in Agra. And so speaking of uh, weaving, this brings us on to a wonderful seek painting that we have in the cell. We have this wonderful depiction of shawls being packed for dispatch, produced by uh, a Sikh artist very much in the style of the famous Bishan Singh. It would have been produced in Amritsar or Lahore in the 1860s or 70s, quite likely as part of a series uh, depicting various stages of shawl manufacture, possibly again for a European patron. Um, there were various exhibitions being held in Paris um, around that time, and this may well have been produced to be sent to be exhibited um, for one of these exhibitions in Paris. It's such an incredible opportunity um, and a privilege, in fact, to be um, handling these wonderful objects, um, cataloguing them, putting together these sales that we do. Um, you learn so much with every catalog that you work on. It's amazing, the, uh, the sales have such a breadth of time period, 1400 years and, and geography as well, from Spain to China, the Indian subcontinent, everything in between. Yet you can find these common threads that run throughout. And as we've seen, I think, today from Akbar and his Agra fort, all the way through the manuscripts and the paintings, to the wonderful rug that we're sitting on woven in Agra centuries later, but with a link to the Mughal Empire. So all, all of these paintings and these objects we've discussed, all of this and so much more, uh, will all be on view in our London galleries from Friday the 19th of April. With the sale taking place on the 24th, not long to go.